History of Asia Part 04 The Russian Empire began to expand into Asia from the 17th century, and would eventually take control of all of Siberia and most of Central Asia by the end of the 19th century. The Ottoman Empire controlled Anatolia, the Middle East, North Africa and the Balkans from the 16th century onwards. In the 17th century, the Manchu conquered China and established the Qing dynasty. In the 16th century, the Mughal Empire controlled much of India and initiated the Second Golden Age for India. China was the largest economy in the world for much of the time, followed by India until the 18th century. By 1368, Chu Yuanzhong had claimed himself Hong Wu Emperor and established the Ming Dynasty of China. Immediately, the new emperor and his followers drove the Mongols and their culture out of China and beyond the Great Wall. The new emperor was somewhat suspicious of the scholars that dominated China's bureaucracy, for he had been born a peasant and was uneducated. Nevertheless, Confucian scholars were necessary to China's bureaucracy and were re-established as well as reforms that would improve the exam systems and make them more important in entering the bureaucracy than ever before. The exams became more rigorous, cut down harshly on cheating, and those who excelled were more highly appraised. Finally, Hong Wu also directed more power towards the role of emperor so as to end the corrupt influences of the bureaucrats. The Hong Wu emperor, perhaps for his sympathy of the common folk, had built many irrigation systems and other public projects that provided help for the peasant farmers. They were also allowed to cultivate and claim unoccupied land without having to pay any taxes and labor demands were lowered. However, none of this was able to stop the rising landlord class that gained many privileges from the government and slowly gained control of the peasantry. Moneylenders foreclosed on peasant debt in exchange for mortgages and bought up farmer land forcing them to become the landlord's tenants or to wander elsewhere for work. Also during this time, Neo-Confucianism intensified even more than the previous two dynasties, the Song and Yuan. Focus on the superiority of elders over youth, men over women, and teachers over students resulted in minor discrimination of the inferior classes. The fine arts grew in the Ming era, with improved techniques in brush painting that depicted scenes of court, city or country life, people such as scholars or travelers, or the beauty of mountains, lakes, or marshes. The Chinese novel fully developed in this era, with such classics written such as Water Margin, Journey to the West, and Jinping Mai. Economics grew rapidly in the Ming Dynasty as well. The introduction of American crops such as maize, sweet potatoes, and peanuts allowed for cultivation of crops in infertile land and helped prevent famine. The population boom that began in the Song Dynasty accelerated until China's population went from 80 or 90 million to 150 million in three centuries, culminating in 1600. This paralleled the market economy that was growing both internally and externally. Silk, tea, ceramics, and lacquerware were produced by artisans that traded them in Asia and to Europeans. Westerners began to trade, with some Chinese assigned limits, primarily in the port towns of Macau and Canton. Although merchants benefited greatly from this, land remained the primary symbol of wealth in China and traders' riches were often put into acquiring more land. Therefore, 
Little of these riches were used in private enterprises that could have allowed for China to develop the market economy that often accompanied the highly successful Western countries. The interest of national glory the Chinese began sending impressive junk ships across the South China Sea and the Indian Ocean. From 1403 to 1433, the Yongle Emperor commissioned expeditions led by the Admiral Zheng He, a Muslim eunuch from China. Chinese junks carrying hundreds of soldiers, goods, and animals for zoos, traveled to Southeast Asia, Persia, southern arabia and east africa to show off chinese power their prowess exceeded that of current europeans at the time and had these expeditions not ended the world economy may be different from today in 1433 the chinese government decided that the cost of a navy was an unnecessary expense the Chinese navy was slowly dismantled and focus on interior reform and military defense began. It was China's long-standing priority that they protect themselves from nomads and they have accordingly returned to it. The growing limits on the Chinese navy would leave them vulnerable to foreign invasion by sea later on. As was inevitable, Westerners arrived on the Chinese East Coast, primarily Jesuit missionaries which reached the mainland in 1582. They attempted to convert the Chinese people to Christianity by first converting the top of the social hierarchy and allowing the lower classes to subsequently convert. To further gain support, many Jesuits adopted Chinese dress, customs, and language. Some Chinese scholars were interested in certain Western teachings and especially in Western technology. By the 1580s, Jesuit scholars like Matteo Ricci and Adam Scholl amazed the Chinese elite with technological advances such as European clocks, improved calendars and canons, and the accurate prediction of eclipses. Although some the scholar gentry converted, many were suspicious of the Westerners whom they called barbarians and even resented them for the embarrassment they received at the hand of Western correction. Nevertheless, a small group of Jesuit scholars remained at the court to impress the emperor and his advisors. Near the end of the 1500s, the extremely centralized government that gave so much power to the emperor had begun to fail as more incompetent rulers took the mantle. Along with these weak rulers came increasingly corrupt officials who took advantage of the decline. Once more the public projects fell into disrepair due to neglect by the bureaucracy and resulted in floods, drought, and famine that rocked the peasantry. The famine soon became so terrible that some peasants resorted to selling their children to slavery to save them from starvation, or to eating bark, the feces of geese, or other people. Many landlords abused the situation by building large estates where desperate farmers would work and be exploited. In turn, many of these farmers resorted to flight, banditry, an open rebellion. All of this corresponded with the usual dynastic decline of China seen before, as well as the growing foreign threats. In the mid-16th century, Japanese and ethnic Chinese pirates began to raid the southern coast, and neither the bureaucracy nor the military were able to stop them. The threat of the northern Manchu people also grew. The Manchu were an already large state north of China, when in the early 17th century a local leader named Nerhasai suddenly united them under the Eight Banners armies that the opposing families were organized into. The Manchus adopted many Chinese customs, specifically taking after their bureaucracy. 
Nevertheless, the Manchu still remained a Chinese vassal. In 1644 Chinese administration became so weak, the 16th and last emperor, the Chengzhen Emperor, did not respond to the severity of an ensuing rebellion by local dissenters until the enemy had invaded the forbidden city, his personal estate. He soon hanged himself in the imperial gardens. For a brief amount of time, the Shun dynasty was claimed, until a loyalist Ming official called support from the Manchus to put down the new dynasty. The Shun dynasty ended within a year and the Manchu were now within the Great Wall. Taking advantage of the situation, the Manchus marched on the Chinese capital of Beijing. Within two decades all of China belonged to the Manchu and the Qing dynasty was established. In early modern Korea, the 500-year-old kingdom, Goryeo fell and new dynasty Joseon rose in August 5, 1392. Taiho of Joseon changed the country's name from Goryeo to Joseon. Sejong the Great created Hangul, the modern Korean alphabet, in 1443. Likewise the Joseon dynasty saw several improvements in science and technology, like sun clocks, water clocks, rain measuring systems, star maps, and detailed records of Korean small villages. The ninth king, Seongjong accomplished the first complete Korean law code in 1485. So the culture and people's lives were improved again. In 1592, Japan under Taiotomi Hideyoshi invaded Korea. That war is Imjin War. Before that war, Joseon was in a long peace like Pax Romana. So Joseon was not ready for the war. Joseon had lost again and again. Japanese army conquered Seoul. The whole Korean peninsula was in danger. But Yi Sun Sin, the most renowned general of Korea, defeated Japanese fleet in southern Korea coast even 13 ships vs 133 ships. This incredible battle is called Battle of Myeongmyang. After that, Ming Dynasty helped Joseon, and Japan lost the battle. So Taiotomi Hideyoshi's campaign in Korea failed, and the Tokugawa shogunate has later began. Korea was hurt a lot at Imjin War. Not long after, Manchurian people invaded Joseon again. It is called Qing Invasion of Joseon. The first invasion was for sake. Because Qing was at war between Ming, so Ming's alliance with Joseon was threatening. And the second invasion was for Joseon to obey Qing. After that, Qing defeated Ming and took the whole Chinese territories. Joseon also had to obey Qing because Joseon lose the second war against Qing. After the Qing invasion, the princes of the Joseon dynasty lived their childhood in China. The son of King Injo met Adam Shoal in Beijing. So he wanted to introduce Western technologies to Korean people when he becomes a king. He died before he could take the throne. After then, the alternative prince became the 17th king of the Joseon dynasty, Hyojong, trying to revenge for his kingdom and fallen Ming dynasty to Qing. Later kings such as Yongjo and Zhongjo tried to improve their people's lives and stop the governor's unreasonable competition. From the 17th century to the 18th century, Joseon sent diplomats and artists to Japan more than 10 times. This group was called Tongshinsa. They were sent to Japan to teach Japan about advanced Korean culture. 
Japanese people like to receive poems from Korean nobles. At that time, Korea was more powerful than Japan. But that relationship between Joseon and Japan was reversed after the 19th century. Because Japan became more powerful than Korea and China, either. So Joseon sent diplomats called Sushensa to learn Japanese advanced technologies. After King Jongjo's death, some noble families controlled the whole kingdom in the early 19th century. At the end of that period, Western people invaded Joseon. In 1876, Joseon was set free from Qing so they did not have to obey Qing. But Japanese Empire was happy because Joseon became a perfect independent kingdom. So Japan could intervene in the kingdom more. After this, Joseon traded with the United States and sent Sushinsa to Japan, Yongshinsa to Qing, and Bobingsa to the US and Europe. These groups took many modern things to the Korean peninsula.